So as Rob said earlier, there are different aspects of openness in, um, in research and I'm going to be talking more about the process of openness than an open, than open content itself. Um, so that's my abstract, which you've probably seen. I'll skip through that. So the context is, um, I am a PhD student through Lancaster University on their online degree in um, higher education research evaluation and enhancement. Um, but the case study I'm doing is through Leicester University. And it's based on this offer that they've put out for um, refugees and asylum seekers around the world who want to do a distance learning program, it's a master's program in politics and international relations. Um, and that's been going since March 2019, and they currently have 24 scholars on that. Um, so to my knowledge, that's the first time that sanctuary scholarships have been made available for distance learning by a UK university. There are a few other universities around the world doing it, um, DCU in Ireland, Uni Nettuno in Italy, um, University of Geneva is doing something sim similar. Um, so my research questions are really about online, enga online engagement. And I'm particularly interested in how people who are, might be called non-traditional learners, for want of a better word, um, how they engage online. Uh, so I want to know how the refugees and asylum seekers in the study depict the lived reality of online learning. Then I will be mapping that onto an online engagement framework. There's a reference um, to Redmond et al. at the end. Um, and I think, I'm not completely sure at this stage, but I think I'll be using a kind of third space conceptual framework to look at people's lived reality as against conceived and perceived realities, but I'm not going to discuss that now. Um, and then I want to know out of that, what are the factors that can enable and or constrain refugee students' engagement in online learning and what recommendations arise for HGIs? So really it's quite a practical focus and, um, and I'm hoping to influence policy and practice at institutional level in widening participation. Um, my methodology slide is quite, uh, well, the, the, this is what I can tell you at this stage about what I'm doing in my methodology. Um, so far, I have six sanctuary scholars who I've been engaging with since July last year, so they've all started at different points in time. Um, I hope to get a few more, but I, um, I will have at least these six I've been doing semi-structured interviews with them, mainly using WhatsApp. Um, I'm attempting to use photo voice. Um, initially, I was trying to get more abstract ideas from them, but that didn't work with photos. So what I'm getting is concrete pictures showing their material environments that they're studying in. Um, and I'm doing an analysis of discussion forum posts and reflective assignments. It is um, qualitative. It's highly ethnographic um, and it's um, it's using grounded theory in a to some extent in the um, analysis phase um, so what I want to discuss here is the aspects around doing this dissertation openly um, and I've divided them into three areas. There are ethical issues, practical issues, and epistemological issues. Um, so I'll start with the ethical issues. Um, and maybe I should just skip ahead to a couple of slides first. I've created a Google site, which I'm calling Open Dissertation. Uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and online engagement in higher education. And as you can see from this slide, or if you actually go to that link, it exists, but there's not much in it yet. It's kind of an empty framework at this stage. But my plan is to um, add chapter by chapter as I go along in draft form 
to this um, to the site, I'll be writing each chapter as a Google Doc, and I don't know if you've used Google Sites before, but it's a really nice um, interface where it will pull items from your Google Drive in, and as you update them at the source, they will appear updated in the in the site. So that's my plan, and then in my blog to be um, blogging regularly as I go along letting people know as and when new items are available and hopefully getting some comments and um, engagement from people as I go along. Uh, so that part was fairly easy to, cut, to get to that point. Um, there are obviously some ethical issues with all of this. The first one that I've spent quite a lot of time agonizing over, and I'm glad Leo's in the room because Leo and Martina Emke and I had a really good Skype session about that some time ago. Um, the default in qualitative research tends to be anony an anonymity, where the assumption is that by making this person known to readers, you're doing them harm. Um, and a lot of us, I think, would challenge that assumption and say, actually, there's, um, the, we have a duty to our research participants, if we quote from them, to attribute them. That's academic integrity. On the other hand, anonymity, obviously, is a safeguarding issue. Now, some of my research participants are very well aware of what, um, what it means to have a presence on the internet. Some of them are themselves journalists or um, poets or they they already have some kind of um, online presence. Um, others might not be so aware. So when I got permission from all of them, um, five out of six of them said, yes, you can use my name, I don't mind at all, and you can use my, my photos. One of them just said, just, just don't put my home address. <laughs> Um, one said she wants to wait and see what I write before she gives me permission to use her name associated with it. Um, my feeling at the moment is that even though I've got permission from the others, I would not mention their names until I would give them a pseudonym, until they've seen what I've written and seen it in the Google site, um, because that provides a kind of concrete space for what it means. Um, I'm still not entirely sure at what point it will be okay for me to say, right, um, you know, I, I will attribute everybody who I've quoted. Um, there are issues specific to um, migrants, forced migrants, and there's some really good stuff in the literature. I um, referred quite a bit to Clark Kazakh. Um, so there are issues about the kinds of questions you ask and the need to avoid re-traumatizing people by asking about experiences they've been through. That's not always avoidable. I can ask, um, I can stick to the questions in my semi-structured interview schedule, um, but things are likely to come up, you know, just one of the people I'm speaking to at the moment, for example, has just received deportation orders and has to move to, potentially has to move to another country, although that's been halted due to the the lack of opportunities for people to travel at the moment. So that is automatically the thing we are discussing. Um, and it puts me, yeah, both of us in a kind of a strange area. I'm the researcher, she's the research participant, but we're discussing things that are extremely traumatic actually. Um, another issue around um, working with people in, in disadvantaged circumstances is that the research itself should give something back to that community. So I'm hoping particularly by my process of making it open and transparent as I go along. There's very little in the literature, it's actually a, a huge gap in the literature. How is online education really working for people? Um, in in situations of forced migrant, um, you know, whether they are internally displaced or in another country. Um, so I'm hoping that at a general level I'll be able to do that. But the particular individuals who've participated, um, they're giving me their time. Some of them are paying for data usage to be able to talk to me for half an hour on WhatsApp or an hour sometimes. Um, I've offered um, 
to give study buddy support, which has been accepted by some of them. That's been really interesting for me as well and enjoyable, um, you know, talking through draft assignments and things with them. I've offered that um, to everybody, all 20, well, all the 18 who've been invited to participate. Um, it's not just people who have accepted the, uh, the invitation. So I'll move on to practical issues then. Uh, initially, I was really, um, I went through a lot of different options about where to release my work in progress openly. Um, I thought I could put it in my blog, but then each chapter would end up being interspersed with blog posts about other things. Then I thought it should go into Figshare, because I realized that uh, lots of people were sharing open stuff in Figshare. Uh, I did a bit more digging around, found that uh, Zenodo is a, an open source, open access, well, I mean, yeah, completely focusing on open um, sharing. So I thought Zenodo would be the place to go, but then I couldn't, with my limited coding skills, I couldn't find a way to make Zenodo really do what uh, Google Sites is doing. So. I came to the I came to Google Sites just as a more or less a convenient way of doing it um, that also enabled me to keep working in Google Docs as I have been doing as I draft my chapters. Next, a key question is when to release each section or chapter. Um, I actually do have a complete version of Chapter One which I haven't released yet. Uh, I have run it by my supervisor. She's given me really helpful feedback on it. Um, so I've, I've updated it based on that feedback and I am bracing myself to release it, but I feel a sense of, um, is this going to be okay? Partly because I am, a, I was a bit worried in the beginning that everything I publish along the way is going to come up and turn it in at the end when I, when I submit my thesis. Um, and it's going to look like this is not original work. Um, my supervisor has dispelled that fear. She said not to worry about that. Um, but I have been advised to avoid engaging anybody who might qualify as a future external examiner in discussion, because obviously I'm hoping to engage an audience, and that audience would be people involved in NGOs and universities supporting refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so I need to, yeah, I need to think that at some point there's going to be an external examiner coming in and that person needs to be coming fresh to it. Um, and then issues of which CC license to use. Um, so I'm still uh, not entirely resolved on that one. Um, I'd love to discuss that if anyone has thoughts on that. Um, and then I have questions around epistemological issues. I hope Rob would agree that these uh, issues in this list are epistemological. Um, that will be interesting to hear. Um, and it's about my voice and my positionality as well as the voices and positionalities of my research respondents. So I realized, partly from the feedback I got from my supervisor in the beginning and partly from a sense of my, my own sense of this is beginning to work, that I needed to bring in more of my own personal voice than I was initially comfortable with. Um, I was feeling quite comfortable with the whole idea of it being quite sort of academic and distanced from me. But Actually, going back to Rob Science again, where he talked about um, about positivism versus interpretivism versus critical realism, um, I'm I fall somewhere between interpretivism and critical realism, and I think the more you go into into perhaps it's interpretivism, well, both of those, the more you actually need to disclose who you are, where you're coming from. For example, my background of relative privilege in relation to most of my research participants and what and the fact that I am perceived, I'm not a member of the university that they're doing their master's program through, I'm not a staff member or anything, but I got access to them via gatekeepers in that institution. Um, I'm in, 
native speaker of English, I've offered, um, you know, academic support and stuff to them. So I'm perceived potentially as having a position of power, um, whether I feel that or not. So those things all affect the way that I interact with my research participants. Um, thanks, five minutes left. That's great. Uh, Catherine Vanner wrote a really interesting uh, CC by piece, which is also in the reference list at the end, about the power dynamics that she experienced and how she worked through that in her PhD research in Canada. Um, so I'm referring to that at the moment with gratitude, I must say. Um, because she is very, um, very open and transparent about where she's coming from. Um, also then, there is definitely going to be variation in the, par in the participants' contributions. Um, and it's not entirely linked to the, I would have thought it would have been linked to the circumstances, but I've got one participant who's in, in the refugee camp in Malawi. Um, with no electricity in his house, he sent me pictures of him drawing water from the well in the camp. Um, so his circumstances are incredibly um, materially disadvantaged in comparison to, to some others. Um, but he has been incredibly generous with his time in talking to me and replying to my WhatsApp messages and so on. Um, but there are others who you know, work six or seven days a week, come home to families with kids they have to look after and so on, and simply don't have time or, you know, are focused on other things. So I am getting variable contributions from the different individuals. And then there's the question of partnership. We all talk about research partners, but actually I think that might be putting undue pressure on people. I'd like people to member check what I write, um, but I don't want that to distract them from the other pressing things they have to do. Um, here are the references that I shared, that I mentioned I would share, and I think um, the slides will be shared and any way you can access them via that. Um, that's a link to my Google Slides at the bottom of that, um, this slide. Um really happy to be here today i'm just going to move to the next slide so hopefully you can see um my side there with my story and um yes you can see a lot of pink <laughs> it's kind of a common theme with me <laughs> um so basically i um just to let you know an update from from last year um I'm I'm a PhD student at Lancaster University, so same university as Gabby, but different uh, departments, I believe. Um, I'm a part-time distance distance learning student, so I'm self-funded, and um, my PhD is a modular program. So we did five modules in part one, and um, and then there's a research proposal and a thesis. So I started it in 2017. Um, I've completed all of my modules so far. And um, it's quite an interesting program, the way it's done, because you you do each of the modules and then you you produce a paper afterwards. So all together, all of those um, papers all kind of add up and go towards your overall um, sort of word count. So <laughs> they're all the, um, the modules that I've completed so far. And I merrily went away then and um, was very excited to go to Galway last year. So we went to the OER uh, 19 um, conference last year and uh, met the folks at GoGN, some of which I'd met for the first time. We had a lovely time. Honestly, if I could have found the photographs, I'd have put them all on here, but I've got them somewhere, so I'll share them in the WhatsApp thing. It was really, really good. Um, I did a very quick... Um, presentation on what I thought I was going to look at at the time, which was all to do with online communities and why they engage um, and why do they stay being engaged. But then, as most people who were at that session found out, because I bored them with it for months and months, I had a very long time of moving house, of so basically um, selling a house, buying a house, pulling out, and then all sorts of things went on for months and months and months. And in the end, my kind of supervisor said to me, do you know what, I think you better intercalate, which basically meant suspend. So I suspended my studies um, at some point last year. Um, and I also left my job because I was a senior academic developer. So I kind of said goodbye. That's my little bitmoji at the bottom of that slide. Um, 
But the good news is I then started working for Association for Learning Technology. So I'm now a membership and professional development manager there, and I absolutely love it. So now that I've been there for about six months now, I'm, I'm now at the time that I'm looking to restart my PhD and revisiting my topic. So here we go. Now, bear with me, because as I said, it's... Um, <laughs> It's lots of kind of um, thoughts that I've been going through, but this is what I found so far. And I think that I'd like to look at this sort of area. So I'm looking at informal online professional learning networks. That's how I'm calling it. In the literature, I've come across lots of different um, ways of describing it. They're either describing it as personal learning networks or professional learning networks. I know they've been around you know, forever, but I wanted to look at the kind of connection between that and open practice. Um, and what I found so far is um, there have been a couple of things that have looked at um, sort of aspects like emotional support and kind of effective characteristics and stuff like that, but not that much. So I thought that might be a hook that I could kind of wriggle into. And I wanted to look at the benefits that people gain from being involved with, you know, obviously their own professional learning networks. Um, and when I started having a quick look at the, the literature, some of the things that I've come across is that um, it's been identified that people um, obviously participate in lots of different networks, lots of different communities. Um, so I found some of these, this area of literature on there where um, they've identified that there's a need to look at the kind of emotional, the kind of social emotional um, presence and things like that underneath it. So I thought it'd be good to look at that. I was also trying to find the link between open practice, and this is where I'm hoping that you guys can kind of help me out as well, that I found Kay's um, work, and I've had a look at her dissertation, and I found a brilliant quote there. I thought, oh, that's it, that's what I can kind of hang stuff on. Um, but I'm struggling with the the kind of the what Rob was talking about earlier, which is what will the value be after I've kind of done this research. So I'd be interested to see whether or not you guys think that this is you know something worth looking at really. So um, some of the questions that I thought I could look at are things like the different factors that encourage participation and obviously then to ident specifically to identify the characteristics in relation to the emotional and effective support that people get from it. And then this is the, the, the question that I need to unpick somehow is what's the relationship between how we network with people and our own kind of open practice so um i know you know hopefully you, you'll have lots of input for me on that side of things um now the other thing obviously um i know i want to concentrate i want to do a qualitative um approach i want to look at lived experience i'm thinking of doing it um in terms of online video interviews obviously particularly at the moment I thought as well of uh, how do I identify what participants I'm going to look at? And I thought, well, look at my own PLN um, and maybe perhaps put out a tweet chat about it and gain kind of um, participants through that aspect and then look at, you know, getting um, interviews done. But obviously at the minute we've got all this impact with COVID-19 and all of that. So I did think, and I'd be interested to hear your views on this, is whether we think that this is, you know, really more crucial now in the light of what we're all going through and i did find um, a very recent article where you know people are kind of saying well yes we do need to look at all of this we do need to look at kind of the um the effects of new things that we're doing now because of all of this stuff going on um so i'm wondering how to kind of frame that um and that's that's what i'm kind of struggling with at the minute i have to say that because of everything that's been going on, I've yet to have a really detailed conversation with my supervisor about all of this. But she did say to me that, yes, it kind, kind of looks like you could go down those sorts of lines when I was briefly kind of talking about it. So, see, I like these little bit emojis, <laughs> social online presence and all that. Um, so in terms of where I am now with my, my studies, obviously I'm looking to see if I can get my proposal in now over the next month or two. 
And then ideally, if I can get the ethics approved and all of that, I can start then doing my data collection. And then I'll be writing up um, at the beginning of next year. That's what I kind of think I'd be looking at. So in terms of some help, please, if that's OK, I'd just like to know whether you think that it sounds like it's a useful piece of research. Um, any tips on where to go next, kind of um, looking for frameworks and things like that to hang things on. And obviously, I'd love some practical advice as well um, in terms of how I, I've been speaking with Gabby about this in terms of how she's been um, doing her stuff very openly. So I'd like to kind of look at that as well. Um, and that's about it, really. That's where I've got so far. As I said, um, it's a very, very short presentation. Um, I've just put my references on there. Yeah, that thanks, Leo. I've just spotted that in the chat. I've been looking at Bonnie's stuff and obviously Chris, Chrissy's um, stuff. She's been very instrumental in a lot of stuff that I've been looking at. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of, you know, I'm starting to pull all stuff together. I mean, for me, it's all about now just what Rob was saying as well is trying to make sure that I've got the kind of research questions right. I don't want to be going off and, and doing um, doing something that then I'm going to, I'm going to sort of regret really. So um, yeah, that's where we are. Okay. Well, good morning. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a little early for me. <laughs> um, I am so happy to be here. Um, I completed my dissertation research with the support of my GoGN PLN. And yes, you did have a presentation for me a little while ago, but uh, I focused it today in 20 minutes. So I hope that helps. I use the same quote because I think it's the most <laughs> meaningful really from my research, that real learning isn't done behind walls or with boundaries. I believe that the real learning begins when we are left to figure something out, to problem solve, to collaborate and discuss with people of experience. It's about the doing and what, we, and what can be learn from the experience. Um, and I hope you hear Dewey and others in that, um, in that quote. So I'm going to talk about um, open educational uh, practices as a result of ex um, that occurred as a result of expanding high school learning environments, spaces and experiences. But for all of you, I want you to really contextualize that this can happen in any learning environment. Um, and I am uh, with the University of Calgary and the Workland School of Education. I'm a sessional instructor there right now. And I'm also working at the University of Victoria. But no contracts after April due to COVID and everything. So if anyone hears of anything, give me a shout. Okay, let's see if this works. So a quick summary of my research. If you want to see more about how I did my research, you can go watch the GoGN webinar. <laughs> but uh, I uh, did a design-based research study, and I did four different projects uh, or prototypes with my with my students, with 23 students and one teacher. What's interesting about my study is that I started with 21 students, and by the end, I gained two. So I gained two other students. Um, so I went from 21 to 23, and I haven't heard of many open studies that um gained participants although i think gabby's and others will definitely do that as well but from what i'm hearing so lp1 stands for learning pathway one um learning pathway two learning pathway three and learning pathway four i'm sorry you can't see this very well but uh everything's there and it kind of gives you a summary of the content and what we did but we started with a smaller inquiry project on how do i search and communicate online who is my online audience? LP3 was how do I solve a community problem? And LP4 is what is my story and how does my story inform my identity? Again, please, you can listen to the GoGN webinar to learn more about the whole research part. But today we're gonna to talk about the findings. So the findings from this research helped me think about the open learning design intervention, which I highly recommend in this transition um, time when we're thinking about how do we transition from face-to-face to, -face to uh, online learning environments? What do we have to think about in terms of open learning design? So the open learning design has four stages and it's all encompassed with reflections. So reflections happen all the time and that's reflections by me as a researcher but also as a as an instructor or a teacher 
And then I develop and support students in transitioning from stage one, building relationships, stage two, co-designing learning pathways, stage three, building and sharing knowledge, and stage four, building personal learning networks, which I thought was fascinating, Deb. We've got that connection right there. Now, the emphasis on reflections, and I went through my research to try to give you a better idea of what I mean by re reflections. I had the students write reflections throughout the whole process, and here are some examples of some of the reflections reflections like I think we learn while having conversations with each other without even realizing it. We often have the mentality of learning only happens in school when that isn't true. Learning happens all around us and these projects really help me realize this. So there you, is an example of how you can see how the student perceived their learning expands beyond the walls of classrooms. Reflections, we've also looked at visitor and resident maps. Sorry, I should have put the title in there. And a visit, the students actually created their own visitor and resident maps throughout this process. And I was trying to see if it changed um, throughout the five months. But this gives you an idea of where they felt or their perception of learning was. And this was another reflection. So this is a more, uh, a different media in order for them, or media and medium to um, describe their where they perceive they are learning and how they perceive they are learning and what tools they perceive they are learning with or what people they perceive they are learning with um they also did their reflections in blogs and so this is an example of um uh uh the community problem that they solved was they created uh um, a rink system or, or registration rink system so everyone could have fair shots on getting onto the hockey rinks here in uh, Airdrie and Calgary area. And so in the blog, I didn't go into detail, but they had to think about why this is a problem exactly like we do in research. Bye, Judith. I also, this is really important and something I haven't seen much about either, but I highly encourage as a researcher, I um, presented with my participants. So this is an example of one of the many presentations I did with um, one of the teachers. I also presented with my students as participants, and that really helped me understand their perceptions um, and their observations and clarify my own data. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as well in terms of a reflection. And finally, they also um, created videos. And so that was another example, but <laughs> it's okay, you can go. Um, another example of how they reflected. So when we think of oldie stage one, it's all about building relationships, especially right now when we think about how, how do we think about safe learning spaces? Um, I really encourage anyone to think of this model and others um, because it's the number one most important thing as we transition into different mediums and different modalities. So some of the quotes that the students said is freedom to choose what you want to learn and how you want to learn it. Is that something happening right now as students are transitioning from face to face to online environments? People can gather information and resources without feeling threatened, which is really interesting. Relaxed and low stress atmosphere. People are honest with each other. People have a choice about how they participate and they can share multiple perspectives. Failure and risk taking is encouraged and recognized and does not jeopardize the learning of others. Why is this so important, especially right now, when I'm thinking is because we need to take the time to create these space, uh, these safe learning um, environments. And then in the middle, it just talks about the stages of relationship building as demonstrated by the uh, students. They start out by building a relationship with themselves. Then they demonstrate it through immediate community and that's their family, peers and teachers, then their outer communities and then to their networks as, as Gabby says. So really to get to that, um, sorry, not Gabby, as Deb pointed out, to get to that network for these high school learners or secondary learners took a lot of effort, a lot of confidence, and a lot of time. So that's something to think about as well. 
co-designing learning pathways, some of the aspects to think about is identifying a personal learning context. The most, one of the most important things that came out of re the research is if it wasn't personal, the students didn't really want to engage in it. They wanted to make it personal. So how do you make it personal? And the only way to do that is to develop a relationship with the student, understand where they're coming from. Negotiate epistemological choice. This is fascinating. It, is, um, it comes from Scardamalia and Barrett are talking about choices and way to learn and why to learn. This, when you start um, using open educational practices, every time I start with my students, students ask, what is going on? Why are you doing this? Why is this different than the way I have learned before? So negotiating epistemological choice is talking about uh, being transparent in your learning design. Uh, you develop communication skills, you promote digital multi and trans literacies, you identify roles and responsibilities, and you identify clear uh, your criteria and assessment. Finally, stage three is this is finally where you start building and sharing your knowledge. Students may not have shared anything up to this point, but it's you have to take the time to encourage them to build their confidence in order to be able to demonstrate clear and transparent evidence of learning throughout their learning pathway. Um, and they might start by just sharing with you as an instructor or teacher or just with their parents, and then they finally take those steps to share with others, usually their peers first and then beyond. Um, this is where they expand and demonstrate their and share their learning or who they share their learning with and as they start to recognize that they're sharing their learning as an individual or as a group or anonymously. Um, there is evidence of they start out with whatever they're doing, thinking about how I am doing this. Um, in terms of I will design for sharing. So I know I'm going to share this out at the end. So what are my choices in terms of digital tools or digital um, mediums that I'm going to use in order that, to ensure that I can share this with others? Um, and then how the students share their learning process. So the importance of feedback loops becomes really important. If students don't get that immediate feedback from me or from others within their network, uh, learning immediately obviously goes down kind of in little um, curves and evidence of their reflections and also evidence of how the students are using outside classroom resources and nodes of learning and knowing that's okay. And this is just some examples of the diff different ways in which the students learned. So you see the teacher learner, the learner in the middle, and then the teacher, the learner, and their friends or their immediate little worlds, but then all the different ways in which they expanded. And what's really important here is that you can see that it goes up into the cloud and digitally, but it also comes down into kind of a place-based in Canada, in many ways, we consider an indigenous view on where I am within um on the land and who i'm connected with and students rely heavily on their local community family religious communities and their passion and, and interest in local communities sports music photography for example so when we think open you kind of go up into the clouds but you also come down and i i'm really surprised at how much this looks like a tree when we think about life and 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 the cycle of life and and the reality of who we are as human beings um this is also interesting when i thought about gabby and deb's research so in my research when we get to stage four building personal learning networks we see the continuum of open learning from the teacher-led walled garden of open exploration which i say is up to age 11 but I also think it's for the emerging open readiness learners, our adult learners as well. So this is where the teacher instructor supports the learner in really understanding and developing awareness around open learning. And they usually bring in their PLN, so the teacher's PLN, in order to support the open practices. What's interesting is if the teacher doesn't have a PLN, in my case, my teacher didn't necessarily, I had to help as the researcher, and then we talked about how he could develop his own PLN in order to get to that transition, which is the teacher-led walled garden and independent open learning. So it's kind of balancing back and forth. And finally, um, developing personal learning networks of their own, because really, Every learner is a butterfly that flies off, and while that's sad, it's also the reality. 
So finally, um, these are some principles of open learning design in any learning context, and this is where I'm ending. Um, open learning is dependent upon the opportunity for learners to co-design personally relevant learning pathways. It's where learners collaboratively and individually share their learning experiences through open and closed feedback loops that include multiple people's faces, perspectives, experiences, and nodes of learning. Learners need to transparently demonstrate their learning in meaningful ways to them that integrate curriculum and competencies. And open learning occurs through stages and continuums and is a personal learning experience that transcends formal learning environments. And I think that's exactly what Deb was talking about as well. Um, and the importance of that transcendence from formal learning into informal learning. And open learning emphasizes the learning process in order to build upon and share community knowledge. There we go. That's right. So that's my dissertation and the link to my dissertation. All right, I'm going to do a condensed presentation. I'm going to be talking about two um, two frameworks, and they're they're very dense. I normally would take more time to to explore them and explain them in detail. So I hope to give a longer webinar with uh, Gojian later on. Okay, so um, all right. Now, just to give a quick overview of what my research is about, uh, the problem I was exploring was that OERs were not widely used and there remain questions as to how to increase their adoption or engagement in institutions. And so the, the, the purpose of my research was to try to develop some kind of model for planning um, to, for, for tertiary institutions interested in OER engagement. So. My guiding question related to this presentation was how are uh, institutions engaging with OER, particularly with respect to instructional design and development. And so what I did was an ethnographic case study and I was focusing on processes. Uh, and within the first framework that you'll see, uh, I was looking at this as a human ecosystem. Okay, I'm skipping over the methodology. And I'm going straight into my first framework, which is Davis's arena. Now, what is the arena? It's the arena of change with technology and education. And it was developed by uh, one of my supervisors. And she wrote a book on the topic in 2018. And the main thing about the arena is that it aims to increase the understanding of the impact of an educational innovation. And what she was trying to do was she wanted to increase the, the understanding in that she wanted to be very um, systematic and holistic with her with her process. She felt that other frameworks, such as Rogers, were too narrow and that they, they didn't enable planning enough because they were too focused. Whereas with Davis's arena, it's very broad. And this is why it takes more time to explain the details. There, there's There's a lot going on in terms of the framework and in terms of the findings that you obtain when you're using it. And so what the arena does is it also complex, uh, clarifies the complexity of a system and it exposes the relationships within. And that's as far as I'm going to go with that slide. Now, why should we use it? Again, it's holistic. It, it, it accounts for a lot of details. It goes from the local to the global, and the most local you get is the course ecosystem. It can be a classroom in a face-to-face -face setting, or it can be online. And the course ecosystem can also be uh, outside of the course, in that outside of the teaching area, in that it's it's about the design of a course. So the course ecosystem can be while you're teaching, so during the delivery phase, but it can also be during the design and development phase. So that's the most local uh, layer, and we reach out all the way to the global layer. And this is what I mean by holistic. We go global in that we're going on to the, we're accounting for the internet, as well as international relationships related to open education. Uh, in the framework, you'll see that there are five sectors, resources, professional, community, bureaucratic, political. There's possibly even room for more sectors um, so not only are we going from local to global, we're also looking at different dimensions. 
again, I need to stress that we're looking at interactions because what I'm going to present uh, in my diagrams are points or seemingly isolated uh, data points, but they're interact they're interacting, and it's just too difficult to represent all of that on a couple of slides. It, this framework also accounts for the impact of culture, and by culture, we mean not only the national cultures that students bring into a classroom, but also the culture of the teacher, and also the personal habits that, that people have. So all of these cultures are all considered. I just didn't have the time to fit it into this presentation. OK. Now, these concentric circles on, on the left here, these are, this is the basis of the map. Uh, the, the types of circles can change depending on the context. So again, at the, at the center, you have the course ecosystem. It's nested within the organizational ecosystem. So that would be the ecosystem of the institution in question. And this is a Venn diagram. So consider that the organizational ecosystem has hundreds, maybe thousands of course ecosystems in it, if you think of any university. It's nested within national eco zone, which itself has so many organizational ecosystems inside. But we don't just look at the universities as organizations. We think of any organization that might be related to an innovation. OK, so within an arena, uh, you will you will account for organizations, perhaps the federal government, which Mitch may have an influence on education. Perhaps it's the provincial or state government as well. Perhaps there are different types of organization that, that have some kind of impact on education. So we consider all of these things they are all part of the Venn diagram, so long as they're relevant to the case you are looking at. And then all of that is nested within the global ecosphere, which again is important because of the internet and um, globalization. Now, uh, the ecosystems contain matter in that this is the things that we map are matter. Um, we have non-living matter, which can be courses, it can be digital digital uh, resources, uh, te teaching plans, policies. All of these are considered non-living matter because, again, this comes from an ecological framework, and so we think of the matter in the environment. Uh, we have living matter, so that now we're referring to the people, but actually not people, but roles within the ecosystem. Um, Bromfenbrenner's people have made links between this and Bromfenbrenner's, but uh, I hope you'll be able to see some distinctions. Perhaps when I, if I do a longer GoGN webinar, I could distinguish the two. Um, okay, so within the living matter, you have, well, we refer to them also as species. So you have the student species, the teaching species, the instructional designer species. Uh, but they include the keystone species. The keystone species is important because that is a role that has a lot of influence on the success of an innovation. They have a lot of influence in minimizing the disruption of, of an innovation. Uh, so normally these are these are leaders within the ecosystem. Within a course ecosystem, during the design phase, the keystone species might be the subject matter expert. Uh, within the organizational ecosystem, it could be the leader of the organization, or it could be the um, the leader within a department within the organization. Okay, now I'm moving on to the second framework. This is uh, Cox and Trotter's OER adoption pyramid. Now, the adoption pyramid came about for a couple of reasons. Um, what Cox and Trotter were trying to do was to look at barriers enablers of OER engagement. There are so many studies out there on this topic, barriers and, and enablers to OER engagement within an institution. And what they found was that barriers and enablers were often treated as a list, um, as though the, these barriers and enablers were all equivocal, they all had the same value. And so what they tried to do was show that they have different they actually have different levels of importance. Um, the context was South Africa, and what they saw was that there were a lot of problems with access 
to the internet, access to computers. And so if, if students in the institution had trouble with access, how could they engage further with OER? And another aspect of the pyramid was that uh, Cox and Trotter looked at how much control a lecturer has over OER, OER engagement versus how much control the institution has. So there's a dipolar um, influence there. And within within the way I've, I've, I've used the pyramid, um, there are many more roles involved. So I expand on that aspect of the framework. So I've had I, I've been stretching, modifying the, the meaning of this pyramid for, for my research. Now, one thing to consider is that the, this power dynamic, this influence dynamic, is in some ways irrelevant. Um, I wouldn't say irrelevant exactly, but it means that anyone can borrow OER. So you're not limited by who has control over that. But where the, the control is limited is where you can create and share an OER while sharing the, the intellectual property rights. With some institutions, the IPR go to the institution, and sometimes it goes to the lecturer, and sometimes there's a negotiation. And as I've been discovering with my research, as open education increases, as it's more, uh, as it's increasingly adopted, um, there's more and more allowance for the IPR to go to the lecturer, to the course developer. Okay, here are the six layers of the of the pyramid. I've just put the keywords here, uh, but I'll explain briefly. Now, on the side, you have this um, continuum from externally determined to internally determined. Externally means we're referring to the institution having more, more uh, control. And internally, we're referring to more the, the, the lecturer that has control. So with access, going from the bottom to the top, access is about access to infrastructure, computers, internet, electricity. Uh, if you have access to all of these things, then you can start considering other uh, aspects of OER engagement. So with permission, we're talking about, again, whether you have the permission to create OER as determined by institutional policy, which can change over time. With awareness, we've got awareness of OER, but beyond that, it's about awareness of the concept. What does OER mean? What does it mean as opposed to other things? What does it mean as opposed to other educational resources? And it accounts for all kinds of misconceptions that can come with OER. Capacity is about the capacity to find, use, create, or upload OER. It's all about the technical skills. So this is mostly about skills. Um, and then we move on to availability. Now, availability uh, refers to not only the OER that you might find on the internet, but also whether you choose to make your OER available to the world. So it goes both ways. And with volition, this is uh, choosing to, to engage with OER. And it's shaped by organizational policy or shaped by organizational culture. and um, so the volition is the volition of the lecture. It's the volition of the institution as well. And it, this is influenced by societal norms within the institution. OK, now in my work, I'm not talking about barriers and enablers strictly. I do refer to them, but I prefer to talk about stressors uh, because, again, I'm talking from an ecological perspective. perspective. And so if you think in the nature, there are different things that can stimulate an action. And the stimulus can lead to a positive or negative action, or sometimes both. And so I, I avoid a little bit the barrier and enabler terminology, and I focus more on the stressors because it's more open-minded about the possible outcomes that can happen. Now, um, I had set this, this presentation up for animation, so... I'm going to be modifying the how I've presented a little bit. So I'm, now I'm going to go into the findings. And here we have a blank arena. This is uh, this displays how all the elements are laid out. We have all of the sectors out on the outside, and their location is important because they show they give a guide. They're they're like axes on on a graph, and they show they 
they guide where elements are mapped onto the arena. So again, we go from the most local at the course ecosystem out to the global ecosphere. And we've got the resources, professional, community, bureaucratic, and political sectors. Um, I'm going to point out just a few um, points in, the, in this graph. So we've got the course ecosystem. We have the course developers and the subject matter expert who are aligned with the professional sector. We've got the OERU uh, that was sort of the basis for this research and that they have the innovative approaches to open education, particularly with the use of open source technology. And so this course that was designed uh, that I, I'm researching uh, within this case was done as a result of the innovation of, of OERU. And so the course developers, they took an existing OER and they modified it and they, they worked with it, they developed it, redeveloped it on Wiki Educator, and then the course that they built up was eventually published on WordPress. Now, the stressors that they encountered along the way were there was there was a variety of them. And I know that this is a bit overwhelming to look at. So I'm just going to point out a few of the possible tendencies we see within the within the stressors. There are stressors that are related to infrastructure access. So again, anything where you've got a problem with internet access within the course ecosystem, that stressor can take the form of a student who cannot download a video. Legal permissions, I've talked about those, so that's in the bureaucratic sector at the organizational level. And then there's conceptual awareness that can happen at all layers. Within the course, it can be, oh, I don't know how to take this OER and change its context for, for, for this course. So it's being aware of what the context is, for example, in an OER. And that goes all the way out to the global ecosphere. Um, and then we have the capacity. So it's all the skills related to course development, for example, capacity that you might develop as a part of an organizational initiative, uh, capacity that you might develop through uh, regional networks or global networks. With five, we talk about the availability of OER, so it's the internet available on the internet, so that's why it's in the global ecosphere, but it's also in the resources sector. And then with personal volition, you see these circles with sixes in them. You see that they're scattered, they don't form a line, and this indicates that volition is a, pro a, a broader topic that has a variety of influences. Um, and one of the important ones was that it, it takes a lot of it takes personal leadership to move forward with OER engagement. And I'm going to end there. Uh, so I'll just go through my references quickly. I'll show you those. And thank you very much. OK, so well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kathy S. Miller. I'm the OER librarian at Oklahoma State University uh, in the US. Um, and this uh, was my dissertation proposal on academic library publishing of open educational resources. I'm gonna hit the down arrow. Is that what will move the slide? No, the right arrow. Maybe just click on the next one. Someone tell me how to get to the next one. There we go. Okay, so uh, this is the purpose statement. Academic libraries are among the institutions and organizations publishing OER. Um, and then an academic library, just my committee really needed a definition of an academic library versus a public library. But uh, so for this, I defined it as a library intentionally aligned with a specific institution of higher education. And my dissertation will investigate academic library publication of OER. Um, and it's specifically concerned with the ramification academic library publishing of OER has on the diffusion process of OER in higher education. And I'll give you just a little bit of background on what brought me to this. As we were discussing our workflow, trying to create a replicable publishing workflow for our 
OER, um, our scholarly communications librarian uh, said, at what point are we going to implement peer review? And who are we going to have do the peer review? And I, as just as we were kind of uh, wrestling with that, we started kind of questioning the role of peer review in uh, OER publication and who gets to ascribe knowledge and who gets to decide it's right when part of the benefit of OER is its elevation of marginalized voices and providing broader access to the scholarly conversation than perhaps our um, kind of power structure that's been in place in the scholarly publishing field has empowered of late. Um, but I have a philosopher on my committee, and he said, can you please ask a more simple question uh, and not go after epistemologies in your dissertation? And so uh, I backed it up to just kind of look at the process of academic library publishing of open educational resource so that we can identify how the libraries are publishing them. Uh, there seems, there's there's some kind of some conflation of open access publication practices and open educational resource publication practices. And that's specifically what I'm looking at, if that makes any sense. Yes, those philosophers. I, I really liked him until that second. Um, so this is a statement of the problem. Um, we know that academic libraries are publishing OER and leading initiatives related to OER, but we don't know <laughs> we don't know much about what's happening in that space. Uh, we don't know what decisions are being made, for instance, about whether or not OER are sent out for review or if they are reviewed in-house. Uh, there's a possible conflation of open access and OER as they're published through the scholarly communications house of the academic library. Uh, and a lot of time has been spent talking about OER in terms of licensing and access and platforms but it's time now for some of these other conversations to be had as well. <clears throat> um, these are my research questions. Uh, I'm looking at how and why. I'll give you just a couple seconds to read through those rather than read them to you. And I have used them to guide my methodology uh, and design. Um, and these are kind of the four categories that I've divided the literature review up into. And these are some of the not, I, I don't know, I hesitate to say seminal articles, but I really wanted to. So in the States, uh, Wiley is the big deal and Hilton. And, and I'm an open ed research fellow and I respect and admire much of their work. But I also wanted the opportunity to highlight a, a lot of the work that's come out of this GOGN group and some of the great scholarship that I've discovered as a result of this association. Um, so I'm going to do a qualitative case study uh, research. And I'm being very specific about calling it qualitative case study research. Uh, Yin makes an important differentiation between teaching case studies and research case studies having to do with the systematic approach to it and things like that. And um, one of the neat things about having landed on a theory as I came into this process was that, as we're talking about theory and methodology, um, so diffusion of innovations, uh, most of the studies have been quantitative. Rogers, of course, 2003, 2004, it's forever ago. But um, most of them have been quantitative, have been surveys. And he himself, Rogers himself, uh, made a, issued a call for more qualitative research, for more research case studies to kind of surface uh, what some of the consequences are of the diffusion of innovations. And so reading through that really helped walk me into uh, the methodology that I wanted to use. Um, the context of the study is Kansas State. Yes, Verena, yeah. Uh, Kansas State University, they're very similar to Oklahoma State University. They're a land-grant university, uh, similar populations, uh, and they have a, a well-established OER publishing program. Uh, they have a rolling grant, so they don't have to like cross their fingers every year and hope that there's money. Um, they have a lot of autonomy as far as the decisions that they make. Uh, plus, I got my undergrad there and wanted an excuse to go back and visit. Um, the data collection, obviously qualitative projects. There'll be interviews, observations, documents, and artifacts. And this is where I kind of, I presented and got my proposal approved on March 13th, which here, was the last day anything was even close to normal. Uh, so when I got this approved, it was with face-to-face -face interviews uh, and, and on-site observations. So I would look forward to suggestions. I haven't started my IRB yet. Um, 
and, and our university has come out now, our, our IRB canceled all projects that had any sort of face-to-face -face, uh, interaction in them at all. So um, would love to, oh, thank you, uh, hear how I can submit this and not have to repropose. Uh, so this is a data matrix and it's little bitty and you can't read it, but I'm happy to share it in uh, the chat or the WhatsApp. And this is a data matrix that my advisor gave me the day before my dissertation proposal and sort of throw this in there. And so it's not populated very well, but I feel like if I had had this um, several months ago as I was working on it, it would have been so useful for me in lining out my methodology. So uh, I kept it uh, I kept it in here and I am looking forward to populating it as I work through the project. Um, and I've got I've gotten away from my script here. Um, so this is, a, I'll, I'll be using thematic analysis. Now I kind of got, Crooked with my committee because in my proposal I cite Yin and Miriam a lot, you know, and, and with, along with each other. And one of my committee members said, "Well, they don't agree," but I feel like I feel like they do. But I'm going to take more of a Miriam uh, approach to interpreting the thematic analysis. But I really want to have the systematic, uh, rigorous approach that Yin uh, says to use in, in case study research. So hopefully, I can I can find that balance. Um, yes, Helen, I'll share I'll share the matrix. I think it is it it, it would be useful. Um, and then this is my timeline, which, like everybody else now, is just a is just that's just that's just a pretty graphic. I wonder how it will work out. hopefully, hopefully it can. But uh, so that's what I am looking at. Questions?